our journey through Zanardi Foundry's production plant continues. And in this video, we will observe the ancient melting and casting process of the cast iron jets, a process which is still evolving today. In our previous video, we started with the design offices all the way to the coupling of the two green sand half molds ready to host the liquid cast iron. Today we will discover the process of melting and casting of the cast iron. Jaws, leader in the industrial spare parts supply, works with companies like Zanardi Foundry for its facilities maintenance and to support the technicians to make the most accurate choice for spare parts. Zanardi Foundry plant has three electric induction melting furnaces operating at main frequency with a capacity of about 28 tons and an installed power of 3,300 kilowatts each. The ovens are loaded by vibrating loading platforms located in the rear part while the liquid basic pig iron is poured in from the front part of the oven, which has been previously tipped. The filling materials used to realize the liquid-based cast iron are mostly pig iron, steel scraps, and scraps of previous castings. All of these materials are stored in different compartments found in the raw material part and are transported to the loading wagons by an electromagnet equipped with a load cell semi-automatically maneuvered by the operator. In order to achieve a suitable chemical composition of the base cast iron, in addition to the three materials mentioned above, graphite, silicon carbide, silicon iron, copper, manganese iron and molybdenum iron can be loaded manually by foundry operators, cure oven operators. This activity is necessary to get closer to the final cast iron composition. During the preparation phase of the base cast iron, which precedes the pouring phase from the treatment ladle or transport phase, the spheritization reaction will take place. It is best practice to take samples from the mold to carry out the thermal analysis and obtain samples for the chemical analysis in order to monitor the conditions and the composition of the mold and if necessary, make corrections to reach the required target. The temperature of the oven is also monitored by an immersion thermocouple probe. The temperature must be consistently monitored since after pouring the molten metal into the treatment ladle it will decrease during the transport phase, which includes ferritization reaction, further ladle slag, and pouring from the ovens to the casting line. As anticipated, the transport to the liquid cast iron from the melting furnaces to the casting line, a ladle is used. It has a capacity of 3000 kilograms, inside which the ferritization reaction takes place by adding suitable ferrule alloys, iron, silicon, magnesium, and nickel magnesium. The ladle, maneuvered by a crane before hosting the liquid base cast iron, passes through a loading station where spheroidizing alloys and corrective materials for the composition are introduced. For example, ferrule alloys such as ferrosilicon and pure metals such as copper and nickel. This is necessary to reach the optimal conditions to obtain the spheritization reaction and the chemical composition of the final cast iron. During the pouring, the very violent spheritization reaction begins inside the treatment ladle, which enables the formation and growth of graphite particles in a spheroidal shape rather than lamellar shape when solidifying. Before pouring the liquid cast iron from the treatment ladle to the casting one, it is necessary to carry out a second ladle slag removal, since the spheritization reaction produces a certain quantity of waste. 
To produce graphite cast iron, it is necessary to implement various stages intended to inhibit the formation of cementite in each area of the casting to be produced. A very effective but complex intervention consists in intervening on the chemical composition using elements called gravitizing, such as silicon. Another type of intervention on the nucleation mechanisms, more effective if delicate, consists of introducing heterogeneous preferential nucleation sites of graphite into the liquid cast iron. This is the process known by the name of inoculation, which enables to eliminate the formation of cementite in thin areas of the cast iron and to control and make the type and distribution of the graphite particles homogeneous within the casting and therefore its mechanical characteristics. During the pouring phase of the liquid cast iron into the casting ladle, a first inoculation is carried out, called pre-inoculation. In this process, inoculants based on iron silicon are added to the liquid cast iron, which allow the formation of nucleuses around which the formation of graphite nodules will take place. In addition to the practice of inoculation, the proportion of metal presence in some chemical elements also pays an important role in the nucleation state. Zanardi Foundry's casting line is an automatic system composed of an unheated pressure casting ladle, also called cold ladle, a nozzle for regulating the flow during casting and control and supervision equipment with PLC and dedicated casting software. Let's see in detail the various components. The metal inside the main room is kept in a modified atmosphere using nitrogen and forced to rise inside a canal exposed to atmospheric pressure, at the end of which is placed the nozzle which acts as a regulating valve for the control of the liquid cast iron flow when filling the bracket below. The casting ladle has a maximum capacity of 4,500 kilograms and is equipped with cameras to control that the nozzle opens to let the liquid cast iron flow. During the casting phase, a second inoculation called post-inoculation is carried out directly on the liquid cast iron flow immediately before entering the earth mold. Unlike the pre-inoculation, the second inoculation is much more efficient as the liquid cast iron is already at a good level of nucleation and furthermore the particles constituting the post-inoculant are finer, a characteristic that facilitates its dissolution. The whole process is automatic and supervised by the operator in the casting cabin, caster, who keeps the flow of liquid cast iron under control, the amount of inoculant introduced, and any anomalies that occur in order to prevent possible interruptions in the process and guarantee the metallurgical quality of the cast iron produced. During the casting process, the operators carry out various analysis on the quality of the final cast iron of the ladle specimens necessary to evaluate the shape of the graphite and the efficiency of the spheritization treatment, the control of the chemical, and the thermal analysis. Once the brackets have been cast, they move forward along the line to allow the liquid cast iron cluster to cool and solidify. During the solidification phase, the material is subject to phase transitions for example, in case we have a hypoeutectic spheroidal cast iron, the solidification phase begins around 1170 degrees, with the formation of primary austenite in the form of dendrite. With the progress of solidification, they will grow and enrich the liquid cast iron around them with carbon. At this point, the carbon oversaturated liquid has created the conditions for the precipitation of graphite nodules between the branches of the dendrites. Later stage, over time, these nodules will be enveloped by the dendrites themselves. Once the cast iron jet is solidified, the earth mold containing the solid cluster is extracted from the brackets. Subsequently, the extracted mold will continue its journey along the cooling line, 
until it will be possible to shatter it and to extract the group below the temperature of the last transformation, around 730 degrees. During this cooling phase, the austenite is oversaturated with carbon. Therefore, the excess of carbon inside the austenite will be rejected by migrating towards the graphite nodules. Austenite begins to decompose in ferrite, creating a ring around the graphite spheroids. This reaction proceeds due to the diffusion of the carbon through the ferrite shell. If the cooling phase is quick enough, the carbon will not spread further through the ferrite shell, thus allowing the birth of perlite within the residual austenite and forming the classic bullseye structure. The perlite formation process is favored by the process of elements called perlitizing, such as copper. The microstructure of perlite is made up of lamellar ferrite and cementite. The cluster, which is now in the air and still partially covered with earth, continues to advance inside the rotary vacuum drum filter. Through the rotary motion impress and the injection of water, it is possible to remove all of the soil residues and to cool down the cluster to room temperature, making it suitable for handling. After passing the rotating drum, in correspondence with an intermediate station called ACME-1, operators equipped with a hydraulic wedge perform a first phase of feeders removal, i.e. they dismember the groups by separating the jets from the nozzles, casting system and fuel supply. Then, the jets and nozzles enter the sandblaster for the final cleaning to exit the station called ACME-2 where other operators, equipped with a hydraulic wedge, complete the phase of feeder's removal. In addition to these operations, the operators also carry out a first visual check on the castings, separating imperfect ones if necessary. They also pick some castings in order to conduct statistical hardness analysis and to take specimens for micrographic examination. Finally, Thanks to vibrating conveyors, the casting reached the first storage area in metal boxes. And from there, they will then advance to the next stages of the process, while any waste ends up in the raw materials part to be recycled. As we have observed, the casting process is extremely complex, with several steps that must be perfectly synchronized to obtain a process without setbacks or slowdowns. In the next video, we will discover all of the processes and procedures that are carried out after the casting of the cast iron casting.